Ata Yehovah Eloheinu Malach Halalem Asher Keshenu B'Mitzvotav V'Etzvotav Lo Asak Ben Verei Torah. Please, Yehovah, make the Torah's word sweet in my mouth and in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name in the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Remain standing as we read from <clears throat> the Torah portion, Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 through 24. Then we're going to be reading from the half Torah, Isaiah chapter 1, 27 through 28. And then we'll read from the Brit Kadashah, Romans chapter 5, 18 and 19. Then Moshe called for all the leaders of Israel and said, Select, take lambs for your families and slaughter the Pesach lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop leaves, dip it in the blood which is in the basin and smear it on the two, door, or two sides and the top of the door frame. Then <clears throat> none of you is to go out of the door of his house until morning. For Jehovah will pass through to kill the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood on the top and on the two sides, Jehovah will pass over the door and will not allow the slaughterer to enter your houses and kill you. You are to observe this as a law, you and your descendants forever. Vayikra Moshe el kao zikne Yisrael vayomer alechem mishku ukhu lakem tsonim mish pochotekem veshachtu ha pesach ulkachtem ugadath azob utbaltem badam asher basaf vihiga tem el hamash kof ve el shte hamzuzot min hadam asher basaf vatem lotetsu ish mi petach boyote abdo doker Vabar Yahova Likov is Misraim, Barach et Hadam el Hamash Kof ve al Ste, Huzot u Fasach Yahova et Patach velo yite Hamash Hit labo et Batekem Likov, Ushmatem et Habda Hazech Likalak Ulbaneak Adolam. Hallelujah. Isaiah 1 27 28 Zion will be redeemed by justice and those in her who repent by righteousness. Rebels and sinners together will be broken, and those who abandon Yehovah be consumed. Zion ba mishpat tibde de v'shabei bits daka v'shaber posh im v'chata u yach dach ozbe Yehovah yiklu. Romans five eighteen and nineteen. In other words, just as it was through one offense that all people came under condemnation, so also it is through one righteous act that all people come to be considered righteous. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the other man, many will be made righteous. Lakin ka sha bi fasha echad nish mu kalbine adam ken biskut achat yizku kabe adam chaim ki a she bimri ha adam he achat hayu harabim el chataim ken bimishma et. So blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and everlasting life in our midst. And blessed are thou, O Yehovah, the giver of the Torah. Hallelujah, someone shout, I am strong. I am rich. Hallelujah, you may be seated in the presence of Yehovah. We're continuing on in our call to holiness I hope you're learning something about this call to holiness. We see in Exodus chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, it's the Pesach lamb. It's the way of salvation. The way of salvation is through the blood of Yeshua. Someone say amen. <clears throat> There's no other way other than the blood of Yeshua. There's no other way other than having the blood uh, uh, placed on the doorpost of your heart. So when we look at the call to holiness, we talked last week about no condemnation. Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation in those who are what in union with the messiah yeshua so we're going to continue on and where we kind of went to at the end was the prodigal son so if we look at luke chapter 15 verses 17 through 24 we recognize that the prodigal son <clears throat> wanted to go his own way left the father we also know that the father even though he's doing what he needs to do still has his eye on the border for his son to return right 
We know that the son goes through his inheritance, which means it can take a, a while to go through inheritance, or it can take not so much. But we find that he ends up really in the pig's pen, <coughs> eating corn with the pigs, and he comes to his senses, and what he says basically is, I can at least go home and be a hired servant and live better than this. And he moves his way home, and his father grabs him, sees him coming, grabs him, and what the son wanted was just acceptance back into the fold. But the father ignores him and calls for a fatted calf, new clothes, new shoes, and a ring. Restoration is wonderful in Yeshua. You know, Yehovah is ready to celebrate over you when we turn back from our sin. And I said this last week, so I'll say it again. I put it up there that we need to keep the word before us. We need to... <coughs> Do it with me. Read it. Meditate on it. Repeat it. Declare it. Believe it. Receive it. So the question is, and that we started to ask last week, and we're going to finish ourselves this weekend asking the question is, why do we feel condemned? There's two reasons why we either feel condemned. First of all, there's a failure to accept and embrace what is written in the scriptures. We talked about that. That one of our hardest things that we have to do is to take that written word and apply it to our hearts. We know what the written word says. It's hard to apply it to our hearts. We know what he says about us. We know what he says <clears throat> that, that the, he has meant only good for us. But it's hard to apply it to our lives because there is life in our eyes. That is beyond the scripture. The second reason why you might feel condemned is because you maybe you might have unconfessed, unforsaken sin in your life, but you are mistaking conviction for condemnation. So today we're going to be looking at the difference between conviction and condemnation because there is therefore now no condemnation for you who know Yeshua. But there is conviction. Conviction, condemnation are two different things. And this confusion can be fatal since <clears throat> conviction is something that we must have if we become insensitive to sin. We have to have conviction. God does not, has not come to deliver you from conviction. Conviction is important to us or we become insensitive. Conviction is good, not bad. Turn to someone and say, conviction is good. It's something that's sent from heaven. It is not manipulated by hell. God has given us conviction. Conviction leads us to repentance. Repentance leads us to reconciliation. We should be happy that God brings us conviction. The Spirit of God is here to convict us, not to condemn us. If we can continue in sin without conviction, then there really is a real danger in our lives. Either our hearts have become so hard that we no longer sense the prodding and reproof of the Spirit, or worse than that, the Spirit of God has simply left us alone. Oh, may the Spirit of God never leave us alone. May He hound us with conviction until we turn back to Him and be what He wants us to be. We should thank God when His, con his conviction breaks our heart and calls us, us to fully yield to the Spirit and heed his rebuke, because heeding his rebuke brings about life. Maybe there's something wrong in your life, and you know it. And that's why there is that gnawing pain deep within. But you need to learn the difference between condemnation and conviction, because the enemy uses condemnation to stop us, to paralyze us, and to get us off the track. And the conviction is to get us back on the path of God. Unfortunately, <clears throat> as believers, we get confused. And we confuse conviction with condemnation. And what we do when we get this uh, confusion, um, we start to do things like rebuke the devil. We try to, you know, this feeling from God, we want to, you know, I don't, this feeling is not I'm supposed to have because I am free, I am free, and therefore if I am free, I am free indeed. So we begin to rebuke the devil, and in, in reality, it's not the devil. You just have to recognize between conviction or condemnation. See, those who confuse conviction with condemnation are driven away from Yehovah, always feeling rejected and therefore dejected, 
But God and his conviction wants us to come back to him, not be drawn away from him. What then is the difference between conviction and condemnation? So let's look at it. Are you ready? Conviction is like the work of the prosecuting attorney. He's proving his case against the defendant and exposing his crime. Conviction is the spirit of God saying there's something wrong there. Your thinking is incorrect. <clears throat> the way that you're moving, what you're saying is wrong. There is this prosecuting attorney that is letting you know this is wrong. We need that. The word of God is actually somewhat of a prosecuting attorney that when we read it, we realize that, oh, I shouldn't think that way. Oh, I shouldn't act that way. Oh, I shouldn't do that. Oh, I shouldn't go there. Oh, I shouldn't fellowship like that. This is our prosecuting attorney. It's letting them know our crimes. The things that we're going after are not right. But condemnation is like the judge's gavel that comes down with the final irreversible verdict of guilty. And when you hear that word guilty, you have nothing to do but feel condemned. Conviction says, you have sinned, come back to me. Condemnation says, you are guilty, get away from me. <clears throat> now, that's how we sometimes respond in our own families. Sometimes the conviction, <clears throat> um, we should be saying, um, what you're doing is wrong. We should be the prosecuting attorney. We should say, oh, that's not right. You shouldn't act that way. You shouldn't say that way. And, but, but I want you to understand that hurts me, so I want you to come back to me. I want you to repent come back to me. But a lot of times we say, listen, what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing, you are guilty, and therefore I need you to get as far away from me as possible. Conviction or condemnation, whether you're experiencing one or the other, the solution is the same. And here's a solution. You must believe the word of God and do what it says. What is this word? Truth. Complete authority. Final authority. It overrides your thinking. It overrides your opinion. It overrides you. Right? It is our constitution. You, can't, you can think the way you want to think. You can do what you want to do. <clears throat> but when you want truth, you have to come to this word, and it overrides you. So whether you are under conviction or whether you feel that you are condemned, the solution is the same. Believe the word of God. Do what it says because there is more than sufficient grace for you. And we sit here with that sufficient grace. We sit here because of the grace of God and the mercy of God, right? See, when Jehovah convicts the unsaved... He does it to bring them to conversion. And as long as they are convicted, they are not yet hopelessly condemned. <clears throat> That's the power of conviction. You're convicted means you're not condemned. If you're condemned, it means it is over. How many know it's not over yet? How many are happy it's not over yet? How many know you're still in the journey? You're, you're, you're still feeling the presence of God, and then God still, <clears throat> whether he's disciplining you or convicting you or, or whooping up on you or timing you out, hallelujah, that means there's still love. That means there's no condemnation. That means the door is still open. That means his hands are still outstretched. When Jehovah convicts us, he does it to bring us back to himself. He doesn't do it to make us feel bad, even though conviction makes us feel bad and it makes us feel bad because we know better and it makes us feel bad because we know someone loved us more than than ever and we are we are betraying them and turning away from them so it should make us feel bad when you're disobedient to your parent it should make you feel bad because who they are they are your parent they are your authority they're the ones who brought life to you and they can also take life away from no they can Conviction for us means that we are still part of the family. How many are glad to be part of the family? People screaming, yelling at you at the family. Thank God <clears throat> you went to visit and they're still yelling at you, till, still telling you how bad you look, still telling you your hairdo's not right, still telling you I don't know why you dress like that. Hey, they're still part of the family. The door's still open. Glory to God. At least I didn't shut the door and lock the door and not, not, didn't let you in. You still have the opportunity. 
So if you are not disciplined, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons, the word of God says in Hebrews chapter 12, 8. So God, that means that as long as you're being disciplined, that is good. When God is silent, not so good. We come to him when we feel disciplined. We confess our sins. We find mercy through Yeshua. We receive grace to turn from sin. But condemnation is a different story. There is no mercy with condemnation. There is a place of judgment and damnation that reigns within condemnation. And it has nothing to do with us. <clears throat> Let me ask you one more time. Again, how many are born again, filled with the Holy Spirit? Raise your hand, shout amen. Then condemnation has no place in you. Conviction? Yes. Condemnation? No. Romans 8, 1 and 2 is not written to the world because it's, they have not accepted Yeshua. Therefore, they are condemned until they come to know Yeshua. But Romans 8, 1 and 2 is written to you because if you're in union with Yeshua, condemnation doesn't belong to you. And it's important that you get that because what the enemy wants to bring to you is condemnation. If you're truly in Yeshua, you are not condemned and should never feel condemned. Convicted? Yes. See, either your mind is refusing to accept what the word says, or there is a pattern of disobedience in your life, and conviction is gnawing at you. Why can't I get this away from me? Why do I always feel miserable? What is going on in my life? I feel so this and I feel so that. Well, two things. You haven't either believed the word of God and then taken upon yourself the character of God, or you are still living a life of disobedience and the conviction, though it seems like con condemnation, is ruling and reigning and pushing and prodding you to come back to him. Either one we don't like. Right? And what's the solution? Believe the word. Do what it says. You are no longer, I'm going to say something, I need you to get it because, <clears throat> um, and you might say it's a play on words, and it could be a play on words, but it's also the truth, and you need to understand the truth because words are powerful. And you need to understand, <clears throat> again, we always talk about how the, the posture of God and how does God see us. And, and sometimes if we don't see ourselves the way that God sees us and we see ourselves the way the enemy sees us or we see ourselves the way that we see us, it really puts us out of on a limb or away from the divine walk and destiny of God because of our thinking processes. So we have to, we have to rethink this thing because <clears throat> a sinner is condemned and a saint is convicted. And if your thinking process, if you are still considering yourself a sinner and not a saint, then you're going to be always thinking the way the enemy looks at you and thinks about you. And you have to realize that you are no longer a sinner, but you are a a saint imperfect yes but radically transformed and wonderfully changed you sitting here imperfect still dealing with sinful nature still finding yourself <clears throat> walking paths that you shouldn't walk, thinking things you shouldn't think, that does not stop you from being a saint. It just means that you have changed. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new, and you're still working on those things to remain new and to become even more newer. But the thing is, you have to remove yourself from the position of what the enemy sees you or what the enemy wants you to see yourself. You have to change your way of thinking. You are not a sinner. We sing those songs, I'm a sinner saved by grace. <clears throat> no, you were a sinner. Now that you're saved by grace, you're no longer a sinner. Again, you might say, okay, I get it, but th that's not really powerful. It is powerful between conviction and condemnation. 
When you know who you are, then you know that you cannot be condemned. You know because you've accepted Yeshua, even if you sin, even if you do disobedience, he will not bring condemnation on you. There is not a gavel coming down with the verdict guilty. He's not telling you to get away. There's always conviction where he's telling you, come near me. Repent. Come near me. My arms are open. I'm waiting for you. Yes, you left the property. Yes, you went and did what you did. Yes, you slept with pigs and ate with pigs, but I'm still waiting. Yes, you blew all your inheritance. I get it. Okay. My arms are still open, and I will convict you. I will let you know it's wrong because when you sit there in that pig pen, your thinking processes start to say, oh, I shouldn't have done this, and I did this, and I did that. That's conviction. That's not condemnation. Condemnation would have kept him in the pig's pen, but conviction brings him out back to the father's home. If we don't understand the difference and we don't teach our children the difference, then we cause our children to remain the pig's pen, that the Father will never receive them, that you would never receive them, that there's never, ever mercy and grace given to them. But there is now no condemnation. Sin is no longer the rule of your life. It's the exception to the rule. <clears throat> if I said how many have sinned or do sin, you're going to all, ra- I hope you all would raise your hand. I mean, not in joy. Yes, I'm a sinner. Yeah, no. But I hope you understand that it's the exception, not the rule. You wake up tomorrow morning or you woke up this morning trying to serve him, wanting to serve him, wanting to do all that you can. And yes, you will fall into a snare and a trap. We get it. You're imperfect, but you're not a sinner. You are a saint. Your habit now is to live for Yehovah, whereas before, your habit was sin. You are no longer a sinner. Let's say it together ten times. Are you ready? And I mean say it with conviction. Ready? One. You are no longer. Say I am no longer. I am no longer a sinner. I am. Come on. Come on. Come on. Say it again. Louder. Louder. Louder! <clears throat> Louder! Hallelujah! Amen. You're no longer a sinner. Well, I'm going to prove it to you. Let's look at the scriptures. Are you ready? Here we go. Psalms. Write these scriptures down. Take a picture of it because I want you to go home and look at them again. Psalms 1, 1 and 5, though you can read it all. <clears throat> it says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. There's a difference between sinners and righteous. What are you? You're righteous. You're a saint. Do you sin? Yes. Are you imperfect? Yes. Does it change you back to a sinner? No. Psalms 26, 9 through 11. Don't don't include me with sinners or my life with the bloodthirsty. In their hands are evil schemes. Their right hands are full of bribes. As for me, I will live a blameless life. Redeem me and show me favor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalms 37, 37, 38, observe the pure person, consider the upright, for the peaceful person will have posterity, but transgressors will all be destroyed. The posterity of the wicked will be cut off. There's an importance to understand which side you're on and who God sees you to be, because if you think that you are condemned, then you will side with the wicked and will be dissolved. Psalms 51, 14 and 15, restore my joy in your salvation and let a willing spirit uphold me. Then I will teach the wicked your ways and sinners will return to you. There's a clear line between a sinner and the wicked. Psalms 104, 34 and 35, uh, may my musings be pleasing to him. I will rejoice in Yehovah. May sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more. Bless Yehovah, my soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where's your place? It's with the righteous. It's with the redeemed. It's with the blameless. It's with the saved. It's not with the wicked or the mockers or the transgressors or the sinners. Where is your place? When you read this Bible, read it with no condemnation, but also allowing the conviction. 
God is not out to get rid of you. He's there to bring you in because you've accepted him. The spirit of God lives within you. Know who you are. Know how he views you. And when you know how he views you, you're willing to go home to him. You're willing to run to him. Listen to the testimony of the Proverbs. <clears throat> the book of Proverbs says this in 110. My son, if sinners entice you, don't go along with them. Just to read that means what? You're not a sinner, so don't let them entice you. You're different than they are. You live differently than they do. You think differently than they think. You're not like them. You're different. Proverbs 11, 31, if the righteous are paid what they deserve here on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner? Righteousness protects him whose way is honest, but wickedness brings down the sinner. Evil pursues sinners, but prosperity will reward the righteous. A good man leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren, but the wealth of a sinner is stored up for the righteous. Thank you, sinners. Proverbs 23, 17, don't envy sinners, but follow the example of those who always fear God. Do you see? Can you read within those scriptures? There is a difference between two different types of people. Who are you? You are righteous. <clears throat> the enemy comes and says, but you've sinned, and you've done this, you've done that. And he tries to raise his gavel, but you need to stop his gavel and say, you don't understand. I'm no longer a sinner. There is now no condemnation that can come on me. The meaning of the words is too clear for confusion. We are not sinners, nor do we follow their ways. See, if we never understand that we're not sinners, then we are enticed by what sinners do. If we understand who we are, then we don't do what we're not supposed to do. We are righteous, so we conduct ourselves righteously. In other words, to be righteous speaks of our conduct and actions, not just our standing before Yehovah. If you know who you are, we even say it to our children, that's not who you are. That's not you, right? That's not you. What you're saying to them is when you say that's not you is that you have <coughs> you have allowed a moment to redefine you. And what you need to do is realize that's a moment and that is not the definition of you. Because you are defined by God. And what God has said is that if you've accepted him, him as the Messiah, and the blood has been applied to your life, and the spirit of God dwells in you, then you are no longer a sinner but a saint. So if you fall into sin, it's not the definition of who you are. It's the exception of the rule, not the rule of life. A sinner has to sin. A liar has to lie. A thief has to steal. Right? You don't have to. But as a born again believer, you can lie. But it's not the rule. It would be the exception. And if you lied, then you have a father who is waiting. And why he's waiting is because he's not left you alone. He's convicting you. Has anyone ever done something wrong and you immediately had a conviction? Yes. Not condemnation, but conviction. When you uh, listen to the enemy that condemns you, it, it makes you hide from God. Instead of come out and meet him and confess it. Wickedness is not our lot. Instead, we fear Yehovah and we shun evil. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 7. Well, we looked at Psalms, we looked at Proverbs, so let's look at Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes says this in 226, For to the man who is good from God's viewpoint, hello, he gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner he gives the task of collecting and accumulating things to leave him who is good for God, from God's viewpoint. This too is pointless and feeding on wind. From what? God's viewpoint I'm not going to say it. I'll say it again. There's two different types of people. There's not even male or female. Jew or Greek. What are the two different types of people that God sees? Sinner and saints. Saved and unsaved. Righteous and unrighteous. That's all he sees. Oh, I'm so thankful. 
Ecclesiastes 7.26 says, I found more bitter than death the white woman who is in a trap, whose heart is a snare and whose hands are like prison chains. That's a good Mother's Day sermon. The man who pleases God will escape from her, but the sinner will be caught by her. Because there's a difference. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and 2, anything can happen to anyone. Same thing can happen to the righteous as to the wicked, to the good and clean and to the unclean, to someone who offers a sacrifice and someone who doesn't offer a sacrifice. It is the same for a good person as for a sinner, for someone who takes an oath rashly as for someone who fears to take an oath. And that point is this. There's good and there's bad. There's clean and unclean, which means there is a distinct difference between two people. And it rains on the just and unjust. So notice the contrast, that the man who pleased Jehovah is in the opposition to the sinner. The former is spared, and the latter is judged. You will not be judged. You will be convicted, but you will not be judged if you've accepted Yeshua as your Savior. So the world, like I said, is divided into two classes, the righteous, good, and clean, the wicked, the bad, and the unclean. And he gives us the example throughout all of life, doesn't he? So what makes you righteous, good, and clean? Only Yeshua. That's it. That's the difference. You are capable of sinning just like the wicked, bad, and unclean people. Right? But the difference is Conviction and condemnation. Because if you do not accept Yeshua as your Savior, <coughs> the gavel of condemnation is on you. If you accept Yeshua, then the prosecuting attorney will point out your crimes so that you will repent of those crimes. So do you see how inappropriate it is for justified, redeemed children of Yehovah to call themselves a sinner? We walk around, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No! You were a sinner. You're saved by grace. Do not consider yourself a sinner again. Do you sin? Now, again, don't, don't climb on your high horse. I am not a sinner. Pastor Joe said, I am not a sinner. I am righteous. You are through Yeshua. Remember who you're righteous through. Remember, who's done it for you? You cannot do it yourself. Works by itself is not going to get you anywhere. Which is really a ridiculous statement because you, don't, you cannot do good works for a long period of time anyway. <laughs> well, Psalm said it. Proverbs said it. Ecclesiastes said it. Let's look what the prophet said. The prophet said in Isaiah 1, 27 to 28, which we read, Zion will be redeemed by justice and those in her who repent by righteousness. <coughs> Rebels and sinners together will be broken and those who abandon and I will be consumed. See the difference? Conviction, condemnation. Isaiah 13, 9, here comes the day of Adonai, full of cruelty, rage, and hot fury to desolate the earth and destroy who? The sinners in it. I, uh, see, <coughs> where's my name tag? I don't want to be called a sinner. I might get caught up in that. Isaiah 33, 14, the sinners in Zion are frightened, trembling, has seized the ungodly. Who of us can live with the devouring fire? Who of us can live with eternal burning? See, <clears throat> if you consider yourself a sinner, then you will live with fear. You should never fear your father because he loves you so much. And he knew where you'd fail before you fail, and he went from the end back to the beginning, and he already knew you before he called you. So never fear him. Respect him. Fear his awesomeness and his deity that you would want to do what he wants you to do, but know how he looks at you. He doesn't look at you with a gavel to condemn you. He looks at you to send his spirit to convict you because, yes, you both, the condemned and the <coughs> uncondemned, could be going down the same path, but one will be convicted and will be condemned. 
Amos 9, 10, all the sinners among my people who say disaster will never overtake us or confront us will die by the sword. So if you are saved, you are not a sinner. You are not a godless rebel. It's important. <clears throat> it sounds simple. It sounds elementary, but it's simple because we struggle in our brains. And what happens is, even as born-again believers, when we do something wrong, <clears throat> we live with condemnation, which, again, pulls us away from God instead of running to God. But you cannot do anything that God is going to not want to forgive you for. Yehovah is not out to destroy and devastate you. He's out to deliver you. I'll say it again. He is not out to destroy and devastate you. He's out to deliver you. Now, again, I can go back. There is discipline. Right? Remember when you used to spank your children? This is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, and they never believed you? And it did. Right? You spanked them, but they didn't see your heart and how it was hurting you. <clears throat> when you're yelling at them and screaming, they don't see your heart. They just think you're a madman or a madwoman, just acting out in crazy ways. And somewhat, it could have been that way. Because sometimes children can make you so frustrated, you act like a madman. Right? I'm just telling you. Been there, done that. Unless you have a perfect child. Everybody's looking at Ashley. The point is you need to open that up. But listen, I love you. I want to discipline you. I don't want to spare the rod, but I'm not condemning you to this life. Because there's something in you, a sensitivity. There's a, there's a willingness and a wanting, <clears throat> and I see it in you. And you need to have that conviction so they don't become hard and then be condemned. Remember, Pharaoh, let's, read this, uh, let's think about the story of Pharaoh. That, you know, let my people go. No. And his heart becomes hardened, and then becomes more hardened, and then becomes more hardened. And then even when he gives up, it still becomes hardened, and he's, there's no way for him. So we have Psalms. We have Proverbs, we have Ecclesiastes, we have the prophets. Well, let's look at some of the Brit Kadashah. You know, in the Gospel of John, John 9, 1 through 34, and for the sake of time, I won't read it. <clears throat> but it's a, about the blind man when Yeshua takes the mud, spits in the dirt, and makes mud, and puts it on his eyes. And <clears throat> the man now sees, correct? And we know it's a big ruckus because the Pharisees want to know who did this. And then they find out it was done on Sabbath. Woo! And uh, so there's some conversation. Then the man's not there. Then the man comes back. And so then Yeshua has another conversation with him. <clears throat> if we look at uh, John chapter 9, verses 1 through 14, if we look at verse 16, it says, At this, some of the Pharisees, or, or Perushim, said, This man is not from God because he doesn't keep Shabbat. Others said, how could a man who is a sinner do miracles like these? And there was a split among them. Sinner. The word sinner, then to them, and also to us, even though they were giving him a name that he shouldn't have, was understood to mean a transgressor, a lawbreaker, or an enemy of Yehovah. So let me ask you this question. Are you an enemy of Yehovah? Well, then you're not a sinner. Yeshua was called a sinner by the religious leaders of the day because they thought that healing on the Sabbath was breaking the law, and anyone who broke the law was going to be a sinner. They summoned the blind man a second time. So let's look at John chapter 9, 24 <clears throat> and um, 25, and then we'll go to 28, 29. So a second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, let me tell you, this is, a, uh, this is how we are sometimes religious. Uh, here's a man who was blind from birth, now gets healed, and we're going to have some uh, conferences. And we're going to try to decide, you know, why is this man seeing? We should just be happy he's seeing. That's not what church people do. So the second time they called the man who had been blind, they said to him, swear to God that you tell the truth. We know this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. 
One thing I do know. I was blind, now I see. It's kind of like what we're going through now. Uh, it does, uh, let's move on. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know who he is. But here's the thing. I'm blind. Now I see. Let me do some praise. And you got me stuck in a conference. John 9, 28 and 29. And then they r railed at him. You may be his Talmud, his disciple. They said, but we are Talmudim of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't know where he comes from. And now it's time for this very uneducated, once blind man to teach these leaders a lesson in theology. So let's look at John chapter 9, 30 through 33. He says, what a strange thing, the man answered, that you don't know where he's from, considering that he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone fears God and does his will, God does listen to him. In all history, no one has ever heard of someone's opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't do a thing. It's a strange thing you religious people don't know what's going on. I mean, a little blind man, just blind from birth, all of a sudden can see. And I think I have some wisdom to give you. Condemnation is for sinners. The next time you falter, fail, do something incorrect, and the enemy rushes in with condemnation, I hope you scream. There is now no condemnation. Don't rebuke the Spirit of God that's convicting you. <laughs> but run to the Father because His arms are open. I believe that my Father has very strong arms, especially in my life because His arms must be held open a lot. Waiting for you to return. Romans chapter 5, 6, and 8 says this, For while we were still helpless at the time, the Messiah died on behalf of ungodly people. Now it is a rare event when someone gives up his life even for the sake of somebody righteous, although possibly for a truly good person one might have the courage to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that the Messiah died on our behalf when? While we were still sinners, which means once he died and we accepted, we are no longer Sinners. See, sin was not only imputed to us through Adam's fall, we actually became sinners because of Adam. But righteousness is not only imputed to us through Yeshua's death and resurrection, we actually become righteous. Look at Romans chapter 5, 19. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, many were made what? sinners so also through the obedience of the other man many will be made righteous as long as you're on the opposite side of Yeshua and still attach yourself to the first Adam you are sinners therefore condemned once you've crossed over to the other side and accepted Yeshua as your Savior he not only makes you saved, he now imputes to you righteousness. So you can say, I'm a saint, not because of who you are, but because of who he is and what he's done for you. Let's look at some more New Testament evidence. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Just have to, yeah, there you go. But if you all prophesy and some unbeliever or uninstructed person enters, he is convicted of sin by all. He is brought under judgment by all, and the secrets of his heart are laid bare. So he falls on his face and worships God, saying, God is really here among you. So here we are. <clears throat> we're in the uh, assembly, and we are prophesying. If there is a believer there, they're convicted, whatever that prophecy would be. If there's an unbeliever, they want to come and know Yeshua. Galatians 2.17, but if in seeking to be declared righteous by God through our union with the Messiah, we ourselves are indeed found to be sinners, then is the Messiah an aider and a better of sin? Heaven forbid. The apostles were not sinners. 
since that would mean that Yeshua promoted sin. That's why he has to make you new. That's why you become righteous. If he said you're still sinners, he's promoting sin. And what does Paul say? Heaven forbid that he would be promoting sin, which is why he sent the Spirit, so that when you do sin, the Spirit of God convicts you, not condemn you. Hebrews chapter 7, 25 and 26, and consequently, he is totally able to deliver those who approach God through him, since he is alive forever and thus forever able to intercede on their behalf. This is the kind of Kohen Kadol that meets our need, high priest that meets our need, holy, without evil, without stain, set apart from sinners, raised higher than the heavens. See the pattern? See what God is saying? What are you? You're saints. What were you? But now you're saints. Let's look at James. We'll get this wrap up here in a minute. Look at James chapter 4, 1 through 4. What is causing all the quarrels and fights among you? Isn't it your desires battling inside you? You desire things and don't have them. You kill and you are jealous and you still can't get them. So you fight and you quarrel. The reason you have is that you don't pray. Or you pray and don't receive because you pray with the wrong motive, that of wanting to indulge your own desires. You unfaithful wives, don't you know that loving the world is hating God? And whoever chooses to be the world's friend makes himself God's enemy. So now we have James, Yaakov, he's talking to a community <clears throat> that is now backsliding and behaving like sinners. Even though they're supposed to be saints, their behavior is like friends of the world. Their behavior, we all can relate. Sometimes our behavior is not the way that it should be, correct? And so Yaakov says in strong words, verses 8 through 10, he says this to them. Come close to God. He will come close to you. Clean your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded people. Wail, mourn, sob. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You who are acting like sinners, who are not supposed to be sinners, I'm going to call you how you're acting, sinners, and all you got to do is come to him. You need to wail. You need to cry. You need to repent. Because if you were truly sinners, then you would be condemned. But you are now being convicted. So come back to God and act like you have some sense. Know who you are. Know who you're supposed to act like. Yaakov is saying that this is not the way things are supposed to be. Yehovah's people should be single-minded, not double-minded. They should be holy, not unholy. They should be clean, not unclean. So quit acting like that. We'll say that to our children. Quit acting like those friends. I know those friends are hanging around. Quit acting like them. What are you saying when you say that? You're not like them. You were raised different. You act differently. When you get around them, you act like them. Quit acting like them. That's not you. What's James saying? What are you all doing? That's not you. That's not what a saint does. That's how a saint acts. You're acting like the world. Come on, sinners. Get back to who you are. And when you're not acting like you're clean and single-minded and holy, then you have to search the repentance. It's time for wailing. It's time for grieving. It's time to get back to God. It's a serious thing when believers are called sinners. It's a serious thing when you forgot who you are, what you're supposed to be doing. And then Yaakov closes the epistle with this exhortation. My brothers, if one of you wanders from the truth and someone causes him to return, you should know that whoever turns a sinner from his wandering path will save him from death and cover many sins. Which means you're a saint, and then you wander away, you're now acting like a sinner, and if we can get you back on the right track, what a blessing that would be. The prodigal son, didn't he act like he didn't have a father? Didn't he act like he was crazy? Right? See, sinners are those who wander from the path and are on the road to death. It is our job to turn such people back to Yehovah. For us, the sentence of condemnation is past. Yeshua took care of it. 
In John chapter 5, 24, the scripture says, Yes, indeed, I tell you that whoever hears what I am saying and trusts the one who sent me has eternal life. That is, he will not come up for judgment, but has already what? Crossed over from death to life. How many are sitting here already crossed over? Therefore, there is now no condemnation. We have to be careful to please him, always being quick to respond to his voice, swift to repent. We need to live a clean, free <clears throat> from mental torment life. Taking that scripture, applying it to our lives, to continue to put sin down in our lives, to renew our minds, to be crucified. And that action demonstrates our commitment to walk in harmony with the Lord. If we are a saint and we are like him, then we need to walk in harmony with him. In order for us to stay free from thoughts of condemnation, we have to learn to take Jehovah at his word. Not just reading it, but take it. And if he says, I forgive and I forget, then accept it at face value. What do we say sometimes? I'll forgive you, but I will never forget it. I'm so thankful that God's not like you. See, you'll remember things 20 years from, 20 years ago I can't even think of. I'm hurt, that's why I'm hurt. Why? Well, 20 years ago, wow, okay. It's a long time to carry that in a little basket. By now it should be stinking, but you're carrying it, so you're keeping it alive. You've been feeding it for 20 years, right? Aren't you glad you don't serve a father like that? See, our father cannot lie. So let me show you some things. Are you ready? <clears throat> Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your com compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. That's a different uh, conversation. You go to your spouse and say that. <laughs> Hide your face from my iniquities. <laughs> Blot out. Psalms 103.12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Wow. Isaiah 38.17, lo, for my own welfare, I had great bitterness. It is you who has kept my soul from the pit of nothingness. For you have, look, cast all my sins, what? <clears throat> behind your back. What happens when you cast something behind your back? We don't see it no more. Where do we keep our sins? Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. We always say it anyway for our own sake, right? Forgiveness is for you, not for them. Because if you continue to have unforgiveness and see it before you, never cast it away, always keep it clear to you, it destroys you. The Father will not be destroyed. He knows what it is to forgive. Who's he forgiven? The ones that are sinners or the ones that are saints? Yes. If you come to know him and accept him, he will forgive you as a sinner, and the, the gavel will be removed, and condemnation will be taken away. And if you're a saint and you sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you. And he sends his spirit to forgive you and to convict you. Romans 8, 1 and 2, what's it say? We've been using it. Did I put it up there? Therefore. Read it with me. Therefore, there is no longer any condemnation awaiting those who are in union with the Messiah, Yeshua. Why? Because the Torah of the Spirit, which produces this life in union with the Messiah, Yeshua, has set me free from the Torah of sin and death. <clears throat> See, the devil, on the other hand, he always lies to you. He repeatedly says to you, your whole will never forgive you. How many's heard it? 
He'll say to you, he won't really <clears throat> um, uh, forgive you or forget what you have done. He will always look at you as a filthy, rotten sinner. So you got to give up. You're doomed. It's over. Forget about it. You'll never amount to anything good because he gets you to think that God sees you in your failure. But God has already redefined you. So here's my close. So says Yeshua, the Messiah. And so says Satan, the liar. Whose voice will you believe? Who are you? Sinner? Saint? Redeemed? Holy? Clean? Righteous? If you've accepted Yeshua, know how he looks at you. And then let the devil know what God has defined you as is who you are. And you have such a loving father that even if you do fail and act like a sinner, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand before Yehovah. If you're a saint, let's stand. If you're a sinner, come to the altar. And receive Yeshua as your Savior. Because he is able. Come on, children. Come on, church. Look at all these saints. There's some more saints coming? All right. I'm glad there's some saints that are coming. Are you a saint? I was just asking. Y'all confused? Here you go. Dun, 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 dun. Woo, Father, I thank you and praise you for this day, for these children that are represented under this prayer show. I thank you, Lord, they'll come to the saving knowledge of you as their Messiah, their Savior, their Lord. Let them walk with you, talk with you, whether they be an Esther or Rachel or Rebecca or Leah, or Sarah or Joseph or Peter or Paul, or Ephraim or Manasseh, Joseph. Use them for your kingdom and for your glory. Father, watch over them, protect them. And Father, Lord, empower them to be a great witness within their generation. We'll give you praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Lift up your hands to receive the priestly blessing.
Yehovah, he who exists, now before you presenting gifts, I'm going to guard you with a head of protection. Yehovah, he who exists, will eliminate the wholeness of being towards you, bring in order. He will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. And Yehovah, he who exists, will lift up wholeness of being, look upon you. He will set in place all you need to be whole and complete. May Yehovah grant all the desires of our hearts, fulfill all our purposes and all our petitions. May Yehovah hear from heaven, quickly answer all our requests. Save us in the day of adversity. And in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, defend us from our enemies, from poverty, and from bondage. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. See you in the Oneg, everyone.